Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what we talk about? Well, I'm getting a little behind on the Jesse Livermore series. There's just so much to cover there. It's going to take us forever to get through it. And bottom line is, do read reminiscence of the stock operator. I'm worried that I might gloss over something that's really important there. But I think the, the value in these series, at least from my humble opinion, is that I'm able to flesh out some things that are that are super important, but make sure you do read the book and not just watch this series. Anyway, we'll get back to the methodology and action over the next few weeks. Go in and watch last week's presentation for a lot more on that. By the way, housekeeping, I do take requests. Let me know when you want me to cover. I'll be happy to cover it here. If not here, I do a weekly webinar every week, and you can sign up for that at davelander.com slash webinar. Register for one. You're registered for all. And I add new shows each week, so it might show a show next February. Well, whenever I plan a show, I, I go ahead and put it up. Twitter, T, at T, following moron. And YouTube is at Dave Landry, DaveLandry.com slash contact if you need to reach me. And if you need to slide from this presentation, all of the presentations combined, and a bunch of other stuff to keep you busy for a long, long time, go to DaveLandry.com slash stock charts. All right, let's jump into Mind to Trade. And we're going to continue with our Jesse Livermore series. As I've been saying at nauseam, we're pulling mostly from Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. We're on Chapter 14 this week. I have pulled a little bit from uh, Jesse Livermore, World's Greatest Trader. Do read that one. And then, of course, also read How to Trade in Stocks. But it, it, as far as the best to, or which one you should read first, read this one first. Then the biography, which is pretty good. And then How to Trade in Stocks. Now, we last left off, Livermore had blown up again. It's really hard to keep count at how many times he has blown up. He had a brief stint in Chicago, and then he, was, then he returned to New York under false pretenses. There was a fellow by the name of Williamson that wanted him to trade in his office and kind of use him as a bit of a shill to hide selling that they were doing. And he also, in the process, had handicapped Livermore where he wouldn't let him trade properly. In other words, he would he would cancel short positions and go long and things like that. And his hidden agenda, Mr. Williamson's hidden agenda, was to unload his brother-in-law's huge estate and kind of use Livermore as a farce so people would think Livermore was selling. Anyway, uh, the conditions were good, but he was knocked off his game due to his hands being tied from these extraneous influences and he ended up in a lot of debt. Now, a couple of lessons going into this. You must make hay while the sun shines because the next four years were very lean, as we'll dig into in a minute. There was not a penny to be made. As Billy Henriquez once said, it was a kind of market in which not even a skunk could make a cent. I left Williamson's and tried other brokers' offices. In every one of them, I lost money. It served me right because I was trying to force the market into giving me what I didn't have to give. To wit, opportunities for making money. Now, he ended up $1 million in debt in this process. So the bottom line is don't force the issue and let the market come to you. Now, for years in webinars, I would say I have no idea why people trade and deal in such mediocrity, especially these very successful professionals. And one of my clients at the time was a psychiatrist. And she said, I think I have the answer for you, Dave. And the reason is if you are a doctor, a lawyer, automatic transmission mechanic, you're forced to take whatever train wreck comes along, even though you might not want to deal with that client, and even though what you do could actually make that client worse or the car worse or whatever the case may be, but you can't sit around and wait for select business. You have to take it all. And so that's one of the psychological reasons, which was kind of like a mind-blowing epiphany for me. So if you are currently successful, in business, and then you begin to trade, the waiting is a lot harder than it looks. And I think Brian Gelber said doing nothing is harder than it looks. So if we take a look at the market early this summer, now everybody says sell in May. Well, that was a that was a bad strategy, right? Which is a lot of stock market adages just plain old don't work. So be careful as if there's a stock market adage you're following out there. Make sure it actually works out. But anyway, it turned out to be one of the better summers, at least in my memory, for a long, long, long time. So we had good, we had Landry Light to the upside, the lows were well above the 30 exponential moving average. And then we come back down to the moving average and begin to chop around. We go below it, which is bad, obviously. We go back above it, but then we go back and forth and back and forth. So 
we've ended up in CHOP. And if you didn't know anything about the markets, and I recommend you do this actually, draw a horizontal line from where we are going back in time and see where the market was. And now we can go all the way back to June with today's bit of a sell-off. So over two and a half months of nail, it's gonna be three months here really soon. As I've been saying a lot recently, recently tweeted out to, or well, whatever they call it now, it's still a tweet, I guess it is, <laughs> X'd out. <laughs> anyway, I said that just like you can't catch a tan when there's no sun, you can't catch a trend when there is none. Now I know it's a bit Captain Obvious, but now's not a good time for the trend follower. The trouble was not that I had lost my grip, but that during those four wretched years, the opportunities for making money simply didn't exist. Still, I plugged along trying to make a stake and succeeded only in increasing my indebtedness. So basically, he was trying to force the issue because he needed money. He tried to trade during less than ideal conditions, even though he knew he should not have been doing that. And as he said before, and as we talked about in prior presentations, a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. I therefore studied my problem. It was plain that the only way out of my troubles was by making money. To make money, I needed merely to trade successfully. I had so... I had so traded before, and I must do so once more. More than once in the past, I had run up a shoestring into hundreds of thousands. Sooner or later, the market would offer me an opportunity. I convinced myself that whatever was wrong was wrong with me and not with the market. That is huge. So it's either you, the market, or it's you for trading a market that should not be traded. So if you're not making money right now, it might be because there is no trend. I received an email this morning from someone and he said, hey Dave, I took your bow tie pattern. I did really, really good with it early this summer, but now I can't seem to make money with it. I keep getting stopped out. What's wrong? And what's wrong is that conditions have changed. As I studied the problem, I saw that it wasn't a case that called for reading the tape, but for reading my own self. Amen. This is why I spend so much time on trading psychology. Attitude is far more important than aptitude. You could be a very smart person and not make any money trading. And you could be of somewhat average intelligence and do quite well if you have the right attitude. I would look up Richard, I believe it was Eckhart, it, it might have been Richard Dennis, but I'm pretty sure it was Eckhart that talked a lot about average intelligence is more than adequate to learn how to trade. A lot of times people are just too smart, so to speak, for the market. I quite cold-bloodedly reached the conclusion that I would never be able to accomplish anything useful so long as I was worried. And it was equally plain that I should be worried as long as I owed money. I mean, as long as any creditor had the power to vex me or to interfere with my coming back by insisting upon being paid before I could get a decent stake together. So just a little background. He had a lot of creditors that were okay with the fact that he owed him money, but he had a couple of guys that were really hounding him down for his money. So the bottom line is, he began to recognize extraneous influences. And as I've said ad nauseum, and that's something I've been writing a lot about lately is extraneous influences. So let's say you have a fight with your spouse, your significant other, or both. <laughs> I, that joke's getting old, huh? You could have some expenses. They could be an unexpected expense or they could be an expected expense. And it could be something like trade goes. Now, the list of extraneous influences is a mile long and you're gonna to have to think about things that could be affecting your trading. As I said before, I used to make a lot of unnecessary trades when I'd walk in my office. It's like, well, why am I doing that? It was such a weird thing. And then I realized it was because I was eating lunch or breakfast and I'd come in after breakfast or lunch and make some trades because I was nice and full and feeling pretty good as opposed to being a little bit hangry. There's actually a study done on Israeli judges and their sentences were far more lenient in the afternoons shortly after lunch than they were before because the judges 
were hangry. I think it's called the hangry judge effect. And I want to say it was Ireland. I know it was um, Dan Ireland because it was done in in Israel. And I would imagine and he's the only um, Israeli I know that's written on behavioral science. But I could be wrong on that. So maybe a Kanerman and Tversky also or Israeli. I'm not sure. I explained the situation, quite frankly, to them. I said, I'm not going to take this step because I do not wish to pay you, but because in justice to both myself and you, I must put myself in a position to make money. So as long as people needed money from him, he couldn't focus on the trading because, like he said, there were four lean years where not even a skunk can make a cent in the markets. And trying to pull money out of a market like that is next to impossible, especially when you're forced to do so. So he took the drastic action of going bankrupt. I was ashamed to go out after I saw the reports in the newspapers, but it all wore off presently, and I cannot tell you how intense was my feeling of relief to know that I wasn't going to be harried anymore by people who didn't understand how a man must give his entire mind to his business if he wishes to succeed in stock speculation. Well, once again, we're kind of circling back to the extraneous. And lately, I've been really, really cognizant of overtrading during this sideways chop. As far as my position trades, I haven't taken any new position trades in months. But I am tempted to still fire off a day trade every now and then to try to make a little money. Because let's face it, you always need money, right? Especially lately. Anyway, but I found myself really cognizant of extraneous influences. I was... I had some issues I was dealing with over the weekend, and I came in on Monday, and I was thinking like, Dave, this is not a good time to trade with all the stuff you have going on outside of the markets. Now, as far as the position trades, that's kind of that kind of goes on autopilot. I have a really good setup. I do my analysis at night. I know where I'm getting in. I know where I'm getting out. I know how I'm going to trail my stop, etc. I make that plan. But I'm just talking about some possible off-the-cuff trade if I'm not careful, and Long story endless, where I'm going with that was I recognized the fact that I had these extraneous influences. And for the first time in a while, I actually walked away from my screens. I went for a walk down on a lake, two or three mile walk, just to clear my head. So you really have to be on top of your game. And you have to identify all those extraneous influences. And on top of that, I would encourage you to eat right and exercise and get plenty of sleep. I don't always do those things, but I do strive to do them as much as possible. So he went back to Williamson, even though Williamson kind of screwed him, but he went back to him. I guess he had no other place to go. And he said, look, I need a stake to begin trading. And Williamson said, look, I'll give you 500 shares or whatever stock you want. You just tell me what you want to buy and when, and I'll cover the margin for you. So Livermore was in a position where he had to wait for the exact psychological moment, as he calls it. A trader, in addition to studying basic conditions, remembering market precedents, and keeping in mind that the psychology of the outside public as the limitations of his brokers must also know himself and provide against his own weaknesses. So you have to know all the little pitfalls of trading that deal with the mechanics of trading, slippage and commissions when they do apply, and all these other things. But in addition to that, you better know yourself and you better know what extraneous influences are influencing you at the moment. There's no need to feel angry over being human. I have come to feel that it is as necessary to know how to read myself as to know how to read the tape. Amen. So what's going on with you? As I preach, the best thing you can do is wake up every morning and write three handwritten pages Get that stuff out of your head. What's aggravating you? What issues are you dealing with? What are you worried about? And so on and so forth. And also keep really good detailed notes. That's how I come to realize as just one small example that I was firing off unnecessary trades because I kept documentation. Is like, geez, how come every time I walk into the office, I make a trade? <laughs> Kind of reminds me, years ago I was out in the country and I chainsaw and it wouldn't work. <laughs> and it would run for about 20 seconds and then it would stop and I'd go, ah! 
And my daughter was outside. She's like, Dad, how come every time you turn off the chainsaw, you go, ah. And I explained to her that I wasn't turning off the chainsaw. But anyway, Livermore, getting back to Livermore, I think that's where we were. He strayed, He stayed away from Williamson's office because he knew if he was there where he could actually trade, he would get caught up into it. Like I just said a few minutes ago, if I stood here or sat here watching the screen on Monday, I probably would have been tempted to place a trade. Instead, I went and took a walk. So instead of sitting there being tempted to trade, he went to a brokerage and he watched the tape very carefully, but from that brokerage, he couldn't trade. That's one example of a commitment device. I'll give you another example real quick. And I've got quite a few, but one that comes to mind was a client of mine who does a lot of day trading and has no business doing a lot of day trading, but he could do fairly well, usually around the open, the first 30 minutes or so. And what he did, he's a physician, so he would trade for the first 30 minutes and his office assistants would say, look, that's it. Give me your phone. And so he closed on everything after 30 minutes, handed the phone. She would change the password to his trading account and then hand it back to him. So day after day, broke and anxious to resume trading, I sat in front of a quotation board in another broker's office where I couldn't buy or sell as much as one share of stock, studying the market, not missing a single transaction on the tape, watching for the psychological moment to ring the full speed ahead bell. Now, in the process of doing this, he became very bullish on Bethlehem Steel. And as he mentioned in the book, prior to that, if you go back a few chapters, he made a lot of money in Anaconda Steel when Anaconda crossed 100. He, back then, his ceiling was if a stock crosses par 100, it was going to continue higher. And he felt like Bethlehem Steel could go to 150 after it took out par. And in watching the stock, which was well below 100, he began to kind of almost goad himself into getting in early. Every point that the stock went up meant $500 I had not made. The first 10 points advance meant that I would have been able to pyramid, and instead of 500 shares, I might now be carrying 1,000 shares. That would be earning for me $1,000 a point. But I sat tight, and instead of listening to my loudmouth hopes or to my clamorous beliefs, I heeded only the level voice of my experience and the counsel of common sense. If I watch a screen, I will trade. <laughs> so it's tough. It, you've got to be really careful not to goad yourself, so to speak, into taking trades. Now, after weeks and weeks and weeks of waiting, I think it was six or eight weeks, it finally got to 98, uh, Bethlehem Steel, that is. Now, he bought it 98, and he was proud of that because he figured it was definitely almost going to go to 100 no matter what. So he kind of violated a system there, but in the book, he seems kind of proud that he bought it 98. So that's kind of interesting little uh, tidbit there. Technically, he should have waited those two extra points. I rushed to Williamson's and Brown's office and put in an order to buy 500 shares of Bethlehem Steel. The market was at 98. I got 500 at 98 to 99. After that, the stock shot right up and closed that night, I think at 114 or 115. I bought 500 shares more. The next day, Bethlehem Steel was 145 and I had my stake. But I earned it. Those six weeks of waiting for the right moment were the most strenuous and wearing six weeks I ever put in. And again, doing nothing is harder than it looks. Nowhere does history indulge in repetition so often and uniformly as Wall Street. When you read contemporary accounts of booms or panics, the one thing that strikes you most forcibly is how little either speculation or stock speculation today differs from yesterday. The game does not change, and neither does human nature. Well, human nature never changes. At one point in this book, Livermore says there's nothing new under the sun. Well, Nothing new under the sun. That actually comes from, I believe, Ecclesiastes in the Bible. So even that saying is nothing new. <laughs> but human nature never changes, and I think it's important to, to understand that. A book that comes to mind is Devil Take the Hindmost. 
it's not the most exciting read ever. And in fact, I think I'm about halfway done. And I put it aside and, and read another half a dozen or a dozen books sent, since. But someday I'm going to finish it. But the bottom line is, it talks about all these booms and panics throughout history. And it's like nothing ever changes as far as human nature. The tulip boom and all these other booms in, in history. The dot-com boom would be something more recent. The housing bubble in 2008 and so on and so forth. I was not and I've never felt that I was wedded in... in dis, how do you say that word? I was not and I never have felt that I was wedded indissolubly, that's a hard word to say. <laughs> he uses a lot of these old words in there that are that you don't hear that much anymore. Anyway, to one side or the other, the market. Now, the point he was making here was that he did make a lot of money on the bull side before, and he did make a lot of money on the bear side before. And you can't get wedded to one side, so to speak. And I've seen this happen throughout my career. It's happened to me more than once in 2000. I think I was a little too caught up with how much money I made in the bull market, and I didn't want to let go of that bull market, even when the market showed obvious signs that it was turning. In 2008, when the market was headed straight down and then began to bottom out, I had a client back then that just absolutely printed money on the short side, and he was doing his own analysis that kind of dovetailed in with my analysis, and he just thought that we had this huge leg lower. We had another leg lower of maybe like 50% or 75%. I forget, I forget how much it was. And the market just started going up and up and up and up. And he kept, he remained bearish, bearish, bearish. And I told him early in this process, look, cash out, pay off your condo. And if you feel that strong about the markets and you're that good of a trader, then keep a hundred grand out or whatever you need to trade and, and trade it. And at least this way, if it doesn't work out, you've got a free place to live. Anyway, a man does not swear eternal allegiance to either the bull or the bear side. His concern lies with being right. I'm not a huge fan of shorting stocks. But I short stocks not so much because it's the only way to make money when the market goes down. The market or stock itself goes down. But it helps me to see both sides of the market. So I might be bullish on something. And if I wasn't shorting or didn't short, I might not see a bearish pattern in the works. A market can and often does cease to be a bull market long before prices generally begin to break. My long expected warning came to me when I noticed that one after another, those stocks which had been the leaders of the market reacted several points from the top and for the first time in many months did not come back. Unfortunately, this might be some very timely advice here. We've got a lot of previous winners, Apple, Meta, and quite a few other ones that so far have broken down from highs and they haven't come back just yet. He must not expect the tape to be a lecturer. His job is to listen for it to say, get out and not wait to submit a legal brief for approval. So I learned a very painful lesson when I was still just a kid and I got goaded into buying a bunch of stock. And when I called the guy up to find out WTF, he said, David, no one rings a bell when the market is topped. And here was a guy who was pumping the stock for, for months and months and months. So don't expect the market to announce to you that the end is near and it's done. However, if you pay attention to the prior leaders, like he said, one thing I do is I pay attention to my database. If I can't find a long side setup to save my life and I'm starting to see shorts piling up, then maybe I need to be shorting or at the least honoring my stops on existing positions and not taking any new longs unless it's the mother of all setups. So he shorted the failing leaders and bought new leaders that were emerging. So, so as he explained, the market was still going up, but some stocks were beginning to falter a bit. So he began shorting those leaders, those previous leaders, and buying some new leaders that were emerging. Now, based on present conditions, I'm short the home builders and I'm looking to buy energy and uranium stocks. So even though defense semiconductors, 
the list goes on and on. Biotech, and a lot of other years, look toppies, as does the NASDAQ itself and the S&P 500. There's a few areas out there, specifically the energies that are still rallying. So maybe that's worth a shot, and the home builders have rolled over, so maybe it's worth shorting the home builders. When something happens on which you did not count on when you made your plans, it behooves you to utilize the opportunity that a kindly fate offers you. So he ended up very heavily short, and he was able to make a tremendous amount of money. And his point is that, especially if you're trading large size like he is, which most of us don't have that problem, then you need to kind of take that gift horse when it comes but even even if you're not trading a big account when everything just looks absolutely abysmal that might be a good time if you're short to begin to lighten up a little bit my experience of 30 years as a trader is that such accidents are usually along the lines of least resistance years ago i was blessed to be able to work with a trader and or for a trader depends on how you want to look at it and he often would say surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend as a trend follower, that was music to my ears. Anyway, such accidents are usually along the line of least resistance on which I base my position in the market. Another thing to bear in mind is this. Never try to sell at the top. It isn't wise. Sell after the reaction if there is no rally. So what's kind of scary here, and believe me, I don't want the market to go down, but if, you, if you're looking at like Apple and Meta and a lot of these other stocks now, especially Apple, they've kind of broken down from high levels and they haven't come back just yet at least. So that's a little bit concerning. Now Livermore gets real philosophical at times, but then he still makes a hell of a lot of mistakes. And so he made all that money in the stock market, a million and a half, and then he piled into cotton and he just like he just loaded the boat in cotton and he had some reasons which weren't necessarily fully related to the tape. And then he ended up losing several hundred thousand dollars overnight, but at least he was smart enough to take his lumps and he paid off his debts. After I paid off my debts in full, I put in a pretty fair amount into annuities. I made up my mind that I wasn't going to be strapped and uncomfortable and minus a stake ever again. Now he also went on to say that he's known a lot of people who've done this over the years and that's really smart to kind of protect yourself from yourself and not have to worry about money by putting some aside. But he also said that in a lot of cases, these gentlemen made it so where their wives could sign off on them, on them getting their money back. And Livermore said in this case, he was not going to do that because he never wanted to be without a stake ever again. And I would encourage you as a trader to put as few financial burdens on yourself as possible because believe me, the market's going to test you from a psychological level. Well, that's all my time for this week. I want to thank all you guys and gals for watching. If you need some follow-up information, the slides in this presentation, a bunch of stuff to keep you busy for a long time, go to davelander.com slash stock charts. If you need to reach me, davelander.com slash contact. And again, join me each week on Thursdays, usually at davelander.com slash webinar. Bring your favorite stock picks and any questions you might have. And on X, I am at Trend Following Moron. I want to thank everybody again for watching and may the trend be with you.